fish in your imaging. My uh, colleague Haytham gave us a very good uh, representation about the anatomy <clears throat> or the surgical anatomy of the facial nerve. In our lecture, we will talk about imaging of the facial nerve in respect to radiological anatomy, not surgical anatomy, indication for imaging, and interpretation of imaging. First of all, when you are talking about radiological anatomy, we have two modalities for radiological evaluation of the facial nerve, the MRI and the CT. Roughly, MRI can be used to evaluate the intracranial and intracanalicular part of the facial nerve, while CT can be used to evaluate the pony part of the facial nerve or the part of the facial nerve within the pony canal or the temporal bone, including labyrinthine, tympanic, and mastoid segment. For the evaluation of intracranial facial nerve, first of all, when we examine any MRI, usually I like to start with the T2. T2 is the surgeon friend uh, cut or surgeon friend protocol of the MRI. It's very good in the anatomy and it's very good start, okay? At first, we should look in the axial view for what we call the stink eye or the superior semicircular canal. Here, of course, is the basilar artery, cerebellopontine angle, prepontine cistern, and this is the pons, middle cerebellar punctal, and this is the cerebellum, and of course, this is the fourth ventricle and the temporal loop. As we move inferiorly, here we can see the cerebellopontine angle and the IAC emerging from the cerebellopontine angle. Here, this is the common cross. And this is the superior limb of the posterior semicircular canal, and here is the vestibule. As we move more inferiorly, here is the bones. When you see in the bones, these two concave lines is what was called facial folliculus. Here, this is the side of the facial nucleus. This is the anatomical side of the facial nucleus and the north out of the cochlear nucleus. Okay, it's very important because uh, this area of, uh, of the bones where the facial nucleus located is in the territory of the ICA or the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So in some cases of facial palsy, some cases of central etiology, you can find some signs of infarction, especially in the diffusion weight image in this area. And this may explain the facial palsy or the facial paralysis in some cases of central origin. Also, here we will find two straight parallel structure passing through the rebellopontine angle to the IAC. The anterior one with the blue arrow, this is the facial nerve. The posterior one with the red arrow, this is the vestibular cochlear nerve. At this site, you can evaluate the intracranial part of the facial nerve and the intracanalicular part of the facial nerve or roughly evaluate its integrity. For the intratemporal part, of course, we will examine the CT. Again, we will start with the axial cuts of the CT especially the cut where the lizard benzene segment start to emerge from the IAC. A very important point, to evaluate the facial nerve properly, you have to examine it serially. You have to start from superior to inferior serially to properly locate the facial nerve as we will see. Here is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve coming out of the IAC. Here, this is the first genio or genaclid ganglion of the facial nerve. Look here, this is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, ferrous genio of the facial nerve, tympanic segment of the facial nerve within its fallopian canal. Again, this is the same picture or picture at a lower cut. You can see the facial nerve clearly, the tympanic part of the facial nerve within its intact canal. As we move inferiorly, now we will find the mastoid part of the facial nerve. Usually, you will find in the pyramids or in the pyramidal prominence, usually you can find two structures. As a rule, the lateral structure is the fissure nerve. The medial structure, usually, this is the pili of the stabidial muscle. Which one of this is the fissure nerve? If you examine a separate cut, axial cut of the CT, you can face such a dilemma. Which one of this is the facial nerve and which are not? To uh, solve this problem, this is the importance of serially uh, uh, tracing the facial nerve. 
as we can see here on the left side, as we trace here this labyrinthine segment, banic segment of the facial nerve, as we trace it downward, 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 I can localize the mastoid part of the facial nerve. I can localize part. As we can see here, this is the facial nerve. And all the others are just air cells. Without serially tracing the facial nerve from superior to inferior using a radiological software, it may be difficult in some cases to actually locate the mastoid part of the facial nerve. In the coronal cuts also, you can examine the facial nerve. The landmark for our master slide is a slight when there is the arch of the posterior semicircular canal. Of course, this is the mastoid air cells as we move anteriorly. Here also, I can find the both superior and the inferior limb of the posterior semicircular canals. Also, it has a snake eye appearance. Here, you can find the jugular nerve as the stylomastoid form. Another cut where we can examine the facial nerve as we move anteriorly in the coronal cut of the IAC. Here, you can find the lateral semicircular canal and the facial, the panic segment of the facial nerve beneath the lateral semicircular canal. Here, as we move anteriorly, as you know, or as my colleague Haysam just said, the labyrinthine segment of facial nerve usually passes anteriorly, then it makes a turn, then pass posterior as a tympanic segment, it makes the second genu and pass imperial as mastoid segment. The coronal cut usually cut both labyrinthine and tympanic segment of the facial nerve, so they both appear as two dots. These are the two dots. The median one of them, this is the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. The lateral one of them is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. As we move anteriorly, here is a very nice slide that I would like to highlight. Here, if we enlarge this picture like that, what is that? Usually, this slide is misinterpreted by a radiologist or by a surgeon as a dehiscent pony canal of the facial nerve, as a tympanic segment of the facial nerve, which is uncovered. This is not true because it's the tensor tympanic tendon. Facial nerve is above it. As you can see, as we move anteriorly near the ferrous genu with the geniculate ganglion, both labyrinthine and tympanic segment appear to be close to each other. And this is the level where the tendon of the tensor tympani can be mistaken as the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Now, what about the indication of facial nerve imaging? I would like to discuss the indication as one of two either to assess or to avoid, either to assess the integrity, and this is the diagnostic indication of the facial, of the imaging of the facial nerve, or to avoid insult or injury of the facial nerve, and this is the surgical mapping. In the assess indication, usually you can uh, describe or you can order uh, facial nerve imaging, of course, in post-traumatic cases, whether it's iatrogenic or accidental trauma, complicated cases of ear, recurrent or gradual or progressive facial palsy, and in certain cases of Bell's palsy, although it's controversial, but it has definitely indications in some cases of Bell's palsy. In the avoid part, or to avoid injury with facial nerve, usually in any type of autological surgery, you have to locate and you have to map the facial nerve before going to the surgery. Yeah, I will talk about mastoidectomy and stabidotomy, CI has a special planning, but uh, due to the time, I will focus only on the mastodectomy and stability. First of all, let's talk about the assess indication to assess the case of facial palsy after temporal bone trauma. As we can see here, this is the axial CT cut. Here we can see clearly the uh, cut of the temporal bone course, uh, as I think Dr. Ayman will talk uh, to us about types of temporal bone trauma. Uh, roughly, we have an otic bone sparing or otic bone disrupting fracture. Here, this is a type of otic bone sparing fracture. As you can see here by the red arrow, yellow arrow is pointing to the opacity inside the uh, mastoid and middle ear cavity. Usually, this represents a hemotympanum. This is an example of otic bone disrupting temporal bone fracture, as we can see here by black arrow. This is the round window, and this is the basal turn of the cochlea. Sometimes the fractures is multiple fractures, comminuted fracture. It's mixed between longitudinal and transverse fracture. As we can see here, 
this is a line of fracture, which is considered to be transverse fracture. Also, this is transverse fracture, and this is fracture even in the uh, squamous part of the, of the temporal bone. As we can see here, also the disruption of the ossicles. Here, as we can see, there is a dislocated or impacted piece of bone on the side of the facial nerve, or this opacity represents hemotympanum. If we take a larger picture like that, here we can see clearly a piece of fractured bone encroaching on the beginning of the tympanic part of the facial nerve, and this is absolutely an indication for surgical exploration. After that, we will talk about cases of complicated otitis medias. The most famous example is complication of cholesteatoma. This is represent, of course, this is a case of cholesteatoma. As we can see here, you can see there is a refraction of the scutum and there is an opacity causing destruction of the air of the pony septa in the mastoid air cells. So this is an erosive opacity. And as we can see here, it's eroding the uh, tympanic part of the facial nerve. But to be honest, usually I am not depending on the coronal cuts alone in diagnosing erosion of the facial nerve. Tympanic or axial cut will be very, very more beneficial or very more informative than the coronal cuts. Also, in case of neoplastic lesion, as we said, any cases of gradual onset facial palsy or facial palsy of recurrent course or facial palsy of progressive course, usually this is an indication for imaging. And the most common finding usually is the neoplastic lesions. Here, this is a short video about case. Uh, uh, I usually I, uh, I choose to offer this video or to uh, show this video because it will show the importance of serially reading the CT. As we can see here, there is the two dots of the superior semicircular canal. Look here, this is the posterior semicircular canal. Here, notice the ballooning of the IAC. Here, there is an osteolytic lesion at the site of the first genu of the first of the facial nerve. As we move downward, the vestibule, the lateral semicircular canal. Again, you can see clearly there is a destructive osteotic lesion at the site of the first genu of the facial nerve. As we move more inferiorly, of course, there is a secondary opacity in the middle ear. But as you can see, the destructive lesion is continuing in the AB tympanum and extending inferiorly. This is the MRI cut of this patient. Notice here on that side, this is the cerebellopontine angle with the IAC emerging from it. This is a T2 axial cut, heavily weighted T2. Look on the other side, the cerebellopontine angle, IAC emerging from the cerebellopontine angle, but it is not continuous. The CSF signal is arrested at the lateral part of the IAC. Look here, you will see clearly that the uh, CSF plane or a cleavage plane or the CF in subarachnoid space at the posterior surface of the temporal loop is in continuity. But on the other side, look here, there is the CSF as the posterior aspect of the temporal loop. Here is the loss of the CSF signal in the subarachnoid space. This suggests there is a lesion here. This lesion is iso-intense to the brain in T2. This is a lower cut. Again, look here, this is very clear that the CSF signal in the subarachnoid space on the posterior surface of the temporal loop is in continuity. But on the other side, definitely, there is a loss of continuity in the CSF in the subarachnoid space on the posterior surface of the temporal loop, suggesting that there is a lesion eroding the anterior surface of the petrous bone, reaching to the posterior surface of the temporal loop of the brain. This is the lesion as we can see here, cause a rest of the CSF signal extending anteriorly at the area of the first genu of the facial nerve and eroding even the temporal loop. It will be more clear in the T1. This is the T1 axial cut. Here, there is a part in the IAC. Here, it's really clearly that we have a lesion, iso-intense in T2, hypo intends to the CSF, and in the T1, ISO intends to the brain. This is a case of official schwannoma. 
causing destruction even of the anterior surface of the petra spoon. Of course, you have to ask for a diffusion weight image and the gadolinium enhancer, but unfortunately, uh, this case will, uh, or, this, or the data that I have that will include, didn't include this information about diffusion weight image, but the diagnosis of this case is official schwannoma. This case is for a child, this child aged 11 years old, presented with a progressive facial palsy over a period of two years. He was treated as a Bill's palsy with no improvement, even for two years, but it will, or I, I think it will misdiagnose because no one asked for an imaging. And this is, of course, this is a very, very uh, bad mistake. Uh, I think as our professor Hisham will discuss about the Bell's palsy, one of the indication of imaging of the Bell's palsy, if you don't have any improvement uh, within six months, even in the literature, some reports advise to do MRI, even if there is no improvement as early as two weeks uh, for early decompression. So any case of facial palsy, which is atypical, you have to order imaging of the facial nerve. This is another case. Axial cut, T2, as we can see here, there is a lesion with a hyper-intense margin, heterogeneous intensity in its centers in the IAC. This is the T1, iso-intense lesion, T1 with gadolinium, iso-intense lesion with a peripheral enhancement, but the lesion itself does not enhance. Okay, this is a very important because this is a diagnostic sign for epidermoid cyst or cholesteatoma. To be sure, this is what we call diffusion weight image. As we can see here, the lesion exhibit what we call the restricted diffusion. This restricted diffusion usually ensure or ascertain the diagnosis of intracanalicular epidermoid cyst. Also, this case was for a lady aged 47 years old, presented with facial of gradual onset progressive course over a period of one and a half year also without imaging. The other part of the indication of imaging is for surgical planning or surgical mapping or to avoid facial nerve injury. How to evaluate the facial nerve before going to the surgical room? As I said, usually trace the facial nerve. Start with the labyrinthine segment, then start to trace the tympanic segment, you have to make sure that the tympanic segment is an intact bony canal, then move downward to properly locate the mastoid segment, then assess the mastoid segment in its vertical part of the fallopian canal. Again, make sure there is the intact fallopian or pony canal over the facial nerve. Don't depend on the coronal cut for such evaluation. Axial cut would be much more honest and much more beneficial. This is the coronal cut. As we can see here, there is a posterior semicircular canal, anteriorly two limb of the posterior semicircular canal and the uh, facial nerve as it emerging from the stylomastoid foramen. A very important point to check in the coronal cut is to make sure there is enough bone, minimal thickness of bone above the vertical part of the facial nerve. Usually the mastoid is a pyramidal or inverted pyramid. So near its apex, there is the least thickness of bone over the facial nerve. Check for the least thickness of bone over the facial nerve. It's favorable to be six millimeter or more. It will be safe when you start your cortical mastoidectomy. Here, these two dots represent the posterior semicircular canal superior and inferior limb. Two important questions has to be asked about the facial nerve. And usually it's a matter of debate for the radiologist and for the surgeon. What is the anterior translocated or anterior position deficient nerve and what is the posterior position deficient nerve? What is the laterally position deficient nerve and what is the medially position deficient nerve? Actually, there is a not sharp answer for this question because usually, in my opinion, it's a relative matter. However, there is some point that we can use to make sure or to evaluate the location of the facial nerve. One of them is to locate the location of the mastoid part of the facial nerve in relation to the lateral semicircular canal. If you find the mastoid part of the facial nerve, this one, emerging from the stylomastoid foramen at the same coronal plane of 
the two limb of the posterior semicircular canal before or behind the posterior limb of the lateral semicircular canal, this is a posteriorly positioned facial nerve. This is a favorable facial nerve in general. Again, this is the dura over the mastoid. This is the mastoid air cells. Look here. At the inferior part of the mastoid, there is a part of dense bone, sclerose the part of the mastoid over the facial nerve. Actually, I find this as a very good in, or a very good step or a very good finding. Why? If there is excessive aeration extending to the tip of the mastoid, when you are doing a cortical mastoidectomy, one air cell will drive due to another air cell, will drive due to another air cell, and you will find yourself suddenly on the facial nerve. But if part over the mastoid part of the facial nerve is sclerosed or is hypopneumatized like that, usually it will protect you, as you will find no more air cells. You will not progress or you will not uh, uh, complete uh, uh, your drilling. So usually this is a very, very good finding. Usually it protects the facial nerve during the mastoidectomy. Again, an important step is to measure the least thickness of bone over the mastoid part of the facial nerve, favorably to be more than six millimeters. This is another example. As we can see here, this is the superior semicircular canal. Here, there is the posterior limb of the, of the lateral semicircular canal. In this case, the mastoid part of the facial nerve is at the same coronal level of the posterior limb of the lateral semicircular canal. Usually, this is considered as a, a favorable, not a favorable, but this is, can be considered as a normal position also of the facial nerve. It will not compromise the facial nerve. Again, measure the thickness of the bone over the facial nerve. But look at such case, there is a vestibule, there is a superior semicircular canal, and this is the anterior limb of the lateral semicircular canal. Here you can find the mastoid part of the facial nerve emerging at the same coronal plane of the anterior limb. This is absolutely an anteriorly positioned facial nerve, okay? If you are planning to doing a mastoidectomy, just cortical mastoidectomy, I think this will be uh, favorable for you. But if you are planning to do CI, if you are planning to do fissure resist approach, no, usually anterior position fissure is unfavorable finding. So as I said before, anteriorly or, posi or posterior position fissure nerve, it can be an anatomical expression, it can be a radiological expression, but its impact on surgery depends on what type of surgery you are going to do. So now we have answered the question about anterior and posterior fissure nerve. What about lateral and medial fissure nerve? Actually, there is a very nice publication for Dr. Alayla Telmisani uh, from the uh, KSA. Uh, usually, uh, or uh, she had, uh, she has proposed a very good method for evaluations of the lateral position of the fissure nerve. Simply, at first, usually we start our coronal plane. And when we find the mastoid part of the fissure nerve by using a software that making line on the screen, we will fix a line on the vertical plane. Then we will move anteriorly to locate the lateral semicircular canal. And we will draw another line, vertical line, at the most lateral aspect of the lateral semicircular canal. Then we determine the relation between these two lines. Line representing the vertical plane or the sagittal plane of the mastoid part, and line representing the sagittal plane of the dome or, or, or of the most lateral point of the lateral semicircular canal. If you find these two lines on each other, this is normal fissure, or you can say this immediate only, this is a normal fissure, okay? But if you find the fissure nerve or the first line medial to the red line, this is a medially positioned fissure nerve. If you find the white line lateral to the red line, this is a laterally positioned fissure nerve. Actually, she has subdivided this lateral fissure nerve into A and B. If the lateral translocation is more than two millimeters, this is absolutely laterally positioned or laterally translocated fissure nerve, and this is compromised the fissure nerve during cortical mastoidectomy and during CR. So now we have evaluated the facial nerve regarding its anterior and posterior position and regarding its medial and lateral position. Now, this is about mastoidectomy. What about stabilitomy? Actually, when you evaluate the facial nerve in stabilitomy, other points are more important. 
you will you shall uh, look for this axial cut when there is the basal turn of the cochlea, middle apical turn of the cochlea. As you can see here, this is not the facial nerve. This is the tendon of the tensor tympani. And as you can see here, it will hop around the process cochlea forms and pass to the handle of the malleus. And this is the longer process of the incus. And this is the head of the stages. This is the vestibule, and this is the foot plate. So this is the axial cut of the foot plate. This is our first surgical field of view. Here you can find inside the pyramid, as we said before, two obesity or two hyperdense structures. Lateral one in the facial, median one is the pili of the stapedial muscle. And here is the pyramids. As we all know, during stapedotomy, usually we use the curate to creating the posterior or the annulus. And your landmark is the pyramid. If you see the pyramid, stop curates because you may injure the facial nerve in the pyramid. Okay? So, it's a very important step to know how much is pyramid projecting over the mastoid part of the facial nerve. If you find a, a reasonable projection, so you are now is about there is enough cone to correct to reach to the foot plate and to the stapes before reaching to the facial nerve. So this is a very point to look for before proceeding with the stabilizing operation. Another point is the site of the tympanic part of the facial nerve, as Dr. Heiss and my colleague said, in relation to the foot plates. Look here, this is the coronal cut, the IEC, this is the foot plate of the stapes, and this is the head of the stapes. Here you can find the tympanic segment of the fissure. So the tympanic segment of the fissure is, is in, in its natural position, superior to the foot plate, not overlying the foot plate. Actually, Sinaroglu has made recently a very, very nice classification of the relation of the tympanic segment of the fissure nerve in relation to the foot plate of the stapes. They divide it into four types. This is type one. When you, this is the normal uh, picture. When you find that the tympanic part of the fissure nerve is just above the foot plate of the stapes. Here, the yellow arrow is the foot plate of the stapes. The white arrow, this is the tympanic segment of the fissure nerve. In type two, this is more favorable. We here find that the fissure nerve is more superior in its position. It's slightly above the foot plate of the stapes. Very favorable during stability. But in type 3, like that, yellow arrow representing the foot plate, as we can see, the white arrow tympanic segment is immediately overlying the foot plate of the stapes. Some may consider it as an indication to upward surgery. And usually, in some cases, you have to upward surgery if you find such a finding. But if you have a surgical planning with a high resolution fine cut CT before surgery, I can expect that finding before proceeding with surgery. And in type four, which is very rare, is to find the fissure nerve as a picture Dr. Heisman just presented, passing inferior to the foot plate of the stapes. And this is type four. So now we have evaluated the fissure nerve. We are going to do a mastoidectomy operation. We are going to do a stabilidectomy operation. As I have said, there is two more other indications for planning, CI and oral atresia. But due to the lack of the time or the limited time, I will stop at this point. And I hope you uh, have signed such information valuable. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for this uh, illustrative uh, presentation. It was really a uh, heavy meal for me uh, for all these details. But uh, first time to see the radiology in such, in such way, very illustrative. Thank